A few years ago, I was uh, at a, in a church service where we were listening to a man who had served as the director of a missions organization, and he was you know, sort of telling his history of these various things that he had done, and he was still raising support uh, for the organization that he would direct admissions for. And one of the stories that he told was of a time uh, when he was in this tiny town in Africa that I can't remember the name of, and in a country that I probably couldn't find on a map. And uh, he said that this was just a, just a tiny airport. And um, anyway, he, he said that when he arrived at the airport, a friend had you know, dropped him off, somebody he was working with there locally, and they dropped him off at the airport. And at the curb where he was dropped off, they, um, there was a porter there to help unload his bags from the car and take them inside. And he was really impressed by that because he just, you know, he, he thought this was such a small airport, he didn't expect that sort of treatment there. But sure enough, this man helped pull bags out of, you know, a couple of bags out of the, the trunk of this, uh, of this car, and he carried them inside for him. And, you know, my friend, uh, this missionary, he said he, you know, that his experience living or working and living in third world countries was that when people see Americans, they don't just think American, they think rich. American. And so he said, you know, he often would get really great service and people would expect a tip. And so he thought that was probably the case here. And so the man carries the bags inside, puts them down in front of the, you know, the little ticket booth where he's going to buy his ticket. And the man turns to him and the missionary, he pulls a dollar out of his pocket and says, thank you. And the man says, yes, sir. And he, you know, kind of walks off, disappears. And then a few minutes later, the man reappears behind the ticket counter. And he said this was the sort of airport that essentially had one that flew one flight every day to one location. That, that was just all they did. And so, but the man comes up behind the ticket counter and he says, can I help you? And he says, yes, I need a ticket for, you know, on this, your next flight going to this other town. And he says, yes, sir. And he sells him the ticket. And he says, if you will, he tells him, he says, you know, if you will, just go right down there to the security checkpoint. And so the man grabs his bags and he carries them down and he gets to the security checkpoint and lo and behold, who is it that's running the security checkpoint? The porter slash ticket salesman says, sir, I need to look through your bags if you don't mind. And so he you know, opens up his bags and lets him look through and he says, okay, if you'll just go down this way, you'll can, you can wait in our waiting area. If you'd like something to eat, you can get something to eat there and the plane will be leaving and gives him an estimate, says he'll be leaving in an hour and a half, two hours, something. And so he takes his bags on down and he goes and, and he's there sort of waiting. And while he's there waiting, this man who's already helped him, he says, there's just a handful of other people there waiting for the flight. And as he's there waiting, the man who's helped him carry his bag in, sold his ticket, done the security check, he notices him walking around to people with a pen and pad. And he comes up to this missionary and he says, yes, what, what would you like to eat? And he says, well, what do you make? He says, I can make anything. I make anything. You want a burger? You want a burger? You Americans, you love burgers. You want a burger? And he says, yeah, okay, I'll take. You know, he tells him his order and he takes down the order and then he goes over to the counter and he proceeds to make everyone's food. And then sometime later, he was sitting there reading a book and he notices that the door to the tarmac opened and he looked out and he would have sworn that he saw this same man putting fuel into the plane. And at that point he prayed, Lord, please don't let him also be the pilot. Like it's just, it would just be too much. He said the thing that really stuck out to him though was that here in this tiny little airport, this one man ran the show. That it was truly a one man operation that he did everything except thankfully fly the plane. Sometimes in life we have, I don't know if it's a desire, if we think it's a need, or if it's maybe an issue of pride, but sometimes we want to be a one-man show. Sometimes we would like to be able to say, this is my life, this is what I'm going to do, I'm going to move these pieces into place, I'm gonna make things happen this certain way. We'll do it at work, we'll see somebody doing something, we think, mm, I could do that better. We'll see somebody doing something, we'll say, you know what, if you'll just, it's almost like watching a kid unwrap a birthday present, and you're like, you know what, if you'll just put it down, I'll open it for you, right? It's just, this is taking forever. 
but we'll do it at work, we do it at home, we do it in our families, we do it in our churches. But the reality is this, is that none of us have been called to be a one-man show. None of us are the porter, ticket agent, ticket taker, security, cook, waitress. No, that's not our job. That isn't it. In fact, the way God has designed our lives to work is that we live a life that is interconnected with other people. That in the church, we are to live a life that is interconnected with other believers. That's what we see this morning and what we're going to see as we look through Philippians chapter 2. We're going to see that, that Paul, as he is writing to the church at Philippi, he, he is sending them a message to say that you don't do this by yourself, I don't do this by myself. And he does this by talking about two different men. And I think that if we look at what Paul's, uh, what Paul's statements about these men are, I think it can tell us something about what characteristics that we should try to emulate ourselves. And so this morning we're going to look in Philippians chapter 2. And it's starting in verse 19, it says, I hope in the Lord Jesus Christ to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by news of you. All right, so he's saying that he wants to send Timothy from him in Rome to Philippi so that Timothy can do work there with the Philippian church. That's his hope that he's wanting to do that. He's already sent Timothy on a couple of journeys to Thessalonica, to Ephesus. So he has some experience, he's you know, been tested, he's been tried, he's ready to send him. And then he uses this word, he says that, that I will be cheered, that I will be cheered by news of you. And I love this, this word that it uses for cheered. Lori, would you bring up that word, that E-U-P-S? The word is E-U-P-S-Y-C-H-O. And the E-U there is like we would pronounce Europe, uh, kind of U or euphonia, U, E-U, U. And then P-S-Y-C-H-O. In English, we would see P-S-Y-C-H-O and we would say psycho, which you'd be like, oh, so that word is you psycho. That's, that's pretty much what I say to myself in the mirror every morning this week. <laughs> you psycho. Um, Thankfully, uh, mercifully, in, in Greek, it's not pronounced you psycho. You actually pronounce that P and the S. The Y, instead of pronounced I, is pronounced uh. And the CH makes a K, like a K sound, and then O. Oh, that's how it's rendered into English. And so the word is yupsuko. I'm going to say it again because it's fun. Yupsuko. Now say it with me. Ready? Yupsuko. One more time. Yupsuko. Yupsuko. That's a fun word to say. And it, it, we render it to say, or we translate it to say, that I will be cheered by news of you. Cheered. And that's just one, this is one of those times when it's like, yeah, that kind of makes sense. But this word holds a lot more meaning, right? It holds a little bit more meaning than this, Right? One of the places that, that archaeologists and even you and I could see this word today is this word is commonly found engraved on tombstones in, in Greece. That if you go to an ancient Greek cemetery that you will see markers, grave markers, where this word is engraved. And it's because it doesn't just mean cheered, right? They're not like that. somebody was like, you know what I want when you bury me I, on my tombstone, I want you to put cheers. No, that's, that's not it. It's not it. It means it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. That EU means well or good. Pasuko is the word for soul or pasuke. And so it means this is well. It is well with my soul. So they're saying, yes, I have left this world to go to the next one. And it's well with my soul. When Paul is writing the church at Philippi, he's saying, listen, the news that I receive from you, I don't want it to just be like, okay, that's good. I don't want it to just make me a little bit happy. I want to hear news from you that makes me feel well within my soul. That I want to have this, this connection to you, this affection for you. I want to receive news that, that makes it well within my soul, what I hear from you. And in verse 20, he says, he explains why he's sending Timothy. He says, for I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. And one of the things that I love about this is that he says that he, he will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. He will be. He's not already. He doesn't say, Timothy, he is already loving you guys. He, no. He says he will be, which 
which doesn't say something about where Timothy is. It says something about who Timothy is. Timothy is the sort of person that when he meets someone new, he cares about them. It says something about his character. That he says, it doesn't matter who Timothy meets. It doesn't matter because here's who Timothy is. That I know when he moves into your community, when he meets you, he will care for you. He will be genuinely concerned for you. He's not just going to pretend He's going to have a genuine concern. This, this really kind of harkens back to what Paul has previously said, that, that we look not to our own interests, but to the interests of others. And he says, that's Timothy. That's Timothy. Timothy's going to come into your town, and he's going to look to your interests over his own interests. And this is not a function of Timothy's personality Right? This isn't like, well, he's just this sort of personality that he's always serving, always caring. No, this is, a, this is a function of Timothy's spirituality. That Jesus Christ has moved in Timothy's life to the point that this is part of his spirit. This is the, a, a, an expression of who Jesus Christ is forming Timothy to be. That he is one who will be concerned about the welfare of others. In verse 21, he says... For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. He says that there are people out there that are doing work, that there are people out there that are even doing missionary work or evangelistic work, and they aren't seeking out necessarily the welfare of those that they're reaching, but the welfare of themselves. That they're seeking after their own interests, not necessarily the interests of the people that they're seeking to serve. So it isn't necessarily an interest in someone else, it's about self-interest. And he says, this is what happens. And, and, and I get it, right? I get that because it's really easy to always see our own problems, right? Our problems always sort of loom large in our perspective. Recently, I heard someone, I heard someone complaining about their employer's contributions to their retirement account, that they didn't like, that they liked the job, but they really weren't happy with their employer's contributions to the retirement account. And they were, they were on, we were, <laughs> they were on their cell phone. We were sitting in a waiting area. And I, I, don't, I don't mean to paint this person in such a way that you're automatically going to dislike them, but I did. Um, because we're in a really small waiting room and they have their cell phone out. And of course they're talking, you know, on speakerphone. So thankfully I get both sides of the conversation. And, and, and they're talking about, oh, there's not, they're, you know, and they're complaining just so much about employer contributions to a retirement account, right? And, and like, it, as in often is the case in a doctor's waiting room, there are people from sort of like a wide swath of life, right? So there are people there who are there who are like, don't know how they're going to pay the copay for seeing the doctor that day. And they're complaining that the contributions from their employer to their retirement are not enough. And you think, why? Well, it's because our own problems always loom large in our way of thinking. There's a meme that's gone around on social media where you see a guy in a car looking at a guy in a nicer car saying, man, I wish I had a nicer car. And next to him is someone on a bike saying, I wish I had that car. And next to him is somebody walking saying, I wish I had that bike. And then there's a guy in a wheelchair saying, I wish I could walk. We all let our problems sometimes loom too large in our thinking. Timothy does not. Timothy does not because he doesn't see the world through the lens of his own experience. He is looking at the world through the lens of Jesus Christ. He says his goal in life is to see Christ glorified. He looks at his experience and says, I deserve a cross that Jesus took for me. So anything that I get is better than I deserve. My niece one time when she was going through when my niece was going through a divorce and I was talking to her and trying to give good counsel, one of the things that struck me, she said, I'm okay because I know that I am a sinner. I deserve death and hell. Anything I get better than that is God's grace. That's Timothy's 
That's Timothy right there. That's his mindset. He says, this is, I deserve nothing except punishment. And so it's not a problem for him to put his own issues, his own problems to the side, and instead to think of the needs of others. And so he will have a genuine concern for the church there when, when Paul sends him. In verse 22, he says, but you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. So they know Timothy's worth because they've had some past experience. And then he uses this, uh, this simile that he has served as a son with a father. Now, many of you know that I had years of experience of working for my dad. He was a, a carpenter and you know, sort of a jack of all trades. And so I worked with him and for him for years and years and years and years until just a few couple of years before his death when he retired. And you know, I, I worked with him a lot. And there would be a time in my life if when I was a teenager, I had read this passage and say that as a son works with a father, I would have thought, so what Paul's saying is he's saying, you know how it is with Timothy. He whines a lot and I can't fire him because his mom will put me in the doghouse, right? Because that was my experience of how a son works with his father. But then as I matured, as, as I grew up, I realized that, that my dad and I had the same interests Right, our, our interests lined up and that I realized when, when I was working that if I wasn't doing my job, if I was being lazy or slacking off, that that was impacting my dad's bottom line. And that if he was paying me to sit around, that was not good. It made me realize why he didn't, why he would have this one guy who worked for him who was an amazing painter but really liked to talk. And he would constantly say, Leonard, please stop talking, start painting because he was paying him to paint, but he was also paying him to talk whenever he would talk, which is why we eventually all got earplugs and just put them in so that Leonard wouldn't talk to us anymore. That's how a son's supposed to work with the father. He looks not to just his interests, but to the interests of the father. He recognizes that they are connected. And so their interests must line up. And so he says, he has worked with me so that his gain is my gain and my gain is his. In verses 23 and 24, he says, I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. So he has this idea, he says, how it goes with me because he's facing trial and he doesn't know what the outcome will be. So he's thinking that he could have a much longer imprisonment. He could be set free. He could be sentenced to death pretty wide range of options. He doesn't know how it's going to go, and so he plans on sending Timothy ahead, but he also hopes that maybe he'll be set free and that he can come instead. And so it's sort of this on the one hand, on the other hand. On one hand, I hope to send Timothy to you no matter what, but on the other hand, I hope that I get to come to you because I hope that I'm set free. And so he has this sort of on the one hand, on the other hand situation here and then in verse 25, he, he starts talking about this other person. Now, I get asked sometimes when I'm in a situation with somebody that maybe isn't from a Baptist background or doesn't know me really personally, they'll say, oh, you're, you're a pastor, so what do I call you? And I get that a lot of sort of different churches call their pastors different things. And I've, you know, I've never really been real comfortable with that question of what do I call you? Um, and so sometimes, depending on what kind of mood I'm in, you know, if I've had a couple of Dr. Peppers at that point in the day, you know, how, uh, you know, how I'm feeling, but I might, you know, somebody say, I'm sorry, what, what do I call you? And I'm like, really, anything's fine. I prefer your holiness but really just his exalted majesty, just kind of whatever you feel like at the time is, is real. No, I tell people, I'm like, just, just call me Chip, just Chip. That's, that's, what, that's what people call me, just, just Chip. And they're like, your name's really Chip Anthony? Your parents named you something that rhymes with chimpanzee? I'm like, okay, let, you know, just call me, just, just call me Chip. And the reason that I don't insist that other people call me Pastor Chip is that that is a title, although when I was, called to serve here, that was a title that was granted to me, that word pastor is a title that is relational. It's relational because 
if, if I take this word and I open it with you and I feed you from this bread, if I feed this to you and you eat it, you consume it and it is transforming your life, then I'm Pastor Chip. If you just see me on the street, I'm just, I'm Chip. Because that pastor is about a relationship. Is about, it is about a connection that happens and usually happens over some time. Paul is about to talk about a man named Epaphroditus and he talks about him and he uses five different terms to refer to him and they all speak to a relational connection. None of them are a title that was, you know, just sort of given to him, but these are names, these are terms of, of affection, they are terms of emphatic commendation that Epaphroditus has earned through relationship with Paul. And so these, these are what he says of him. These are the, the things that he says of him in verse 25. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my need. Five different terms that are warm, that are commending. Brother, worker, soldier, messenger, minister. The first three are ones that are connected to his affiliation with Paul. The first one is, is he says he's a, a brother. And when he talks about him being a brother, this isn't just saying that he's, you know, just another Christian. Paul doesn't use brother that way in this instance in, in that way. So he's saying that he, is, he has a connection, a, a deep affection for Epaphroditus. He says, he calls him a, a fellow worker. And this work for worker, synergon, is used not to refer to all Christians. It's never used to refer to all Christians, but instead it's used to, be, to refer to Christians who have distinguished themselves from the rest of a congregation. It's used three times with the expression, a worker of God. It's used a couple of times, a worker in Christ. Paul uses it a few times to say, a worker with me. He says, this is Epaphroditus, that it isn't just that he's, he's, he's a worker because he's a Christian. No, he's distinguished himself. He's done something special to earn this title, a fellow worker, a fellow worker. And then he says, a fellow soldier, a fellow soldier. And the word that is used here for a fellow soldier, it literally means one who fights by my side. It's the word it comes from the uh, Greek phalanx, where you would have soldiers who would holding a shield on their left arm, they'd have a spear in their right hand, and your shield would protect about 70% of your body and about 30% of the body of the person to your left, and you would hold it like this. And this person who's holding a shield that is protecting you, that's a fellow soldier. That is the one who is by your side in the midst of a battle. That is the one who, if you are struck down, that they step to cover you so that even though you may be injured, they are not going to let you die. They're going to take care of you. So when he talks about Epaphroditus, it isn't just, yep, he's, a, he's in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. It's not just that. It's he's fought by my side. We have struggled together. We have suffered together. This is who Epaphroditus is. He's a brother. He's a worker. He's a soldier. And not only that, these are the ways he's connected to Paul, but he also talks about the ways that he's connected to the Philippian church. And he says, he's your messenger, your emissary, your representative. You thought enough of him to send him out with your name on him. You put your stamp of approval on him. He's your messenger and he's your minister, which means he has met my needs for your sake which communicates something about the church and Epaphroditus, that they were informed enough to know the needs, they were concerned enough to do something about it, and that they trusted Epaphroditus to be the one to do it. This is the description that he gives of him, these five things, brother, worker, soldier, messenger, and minister. And when he's describing him, he says that he's sending him back to Philippi because Verse 26, for he has been longing for you and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. He says, I am choosing this. I am sending him back. This isn't his choice. This is my choice. I'm choosing to send him back because he's been longing to see you, which we can understand that, that you would long for, for people at home. 
He says, but also because you heard he was ill. When I pastored in Central Texas a few years ago, my predecessor, the pastor at the church before me, he would, every time he went to the hospital to visit people, he would get on Facebook and he would check in at the hospital. So it's a brother, you know, David is at Hillcrest Hospital in Waco. And people liked that. People liked knowing that the pastor was going out and doing visits. An important thing to note at this point in the story is that David's mother was deceased. Some of you know where this story is going. When I went to that church and started the first week that I was there, I went and visited the hospital. And following suit, I posted on Facebook. I checked in at the hospital. Chip Anthony checked in at Hillcrest Hospital in Waco, Texas. And then I turned off my phone because I don't want my phone ringing while I'm in somebody's hospital room, right? That's, you know, I think that's courtesy. So I, like an idiot, turned off my phone. I went to the hospital, I did some visits. About 45 minutes later, I leave the hospital and I have 15 missed phone calls and a dozen text messages from my mom saying, Chip, what's wrong? Chip, what's wrong? Chip, why are you at the hospital? Chip, why are you at the hospital? Why are you at the hospital? Why aren't you answering me? Why aren't you answering my phone? And I said, oh no, I've got to take this off Facebook. So I'll go on to Facebook and I'm about to delete it. And not only has she texted me wondering what's wrong, she's on Facebook saying, does anyone know what's wrong with my son? <sighs> Which is a door I don't ever want somebody to open in public forum. You know. <laughs> well, if you really want to know what's wrong with this guy, let me tell you. First, punctuality. No, you know, but right, she's concerned, right? She was concerned. And so I immediately had to call and say, Mom, please stop. Right? I'm fine. I was just visiting people. So well, I'm your mother. You need to call me and tell me before you visit people. Okay, Mom, I, you know, I will. From now on, I'll just not check in on Facebook. Um, yeah. But that's what, that's what it is, you know, right? Like when we, when we love somebody, when we love somebody, when we're concerned about somebody, when we, when we hear that they're ill, when, we, when we're on the phone and we hear them crying, when we know that they're upset, we, we want to know that, that they're better. We want to know that, that whatever situation they're facing, that they can handle it. And if they can't, we want them to know that we're there to help them with it. We want, we want to send words of concern we want to hear their voice, tell them of our love, and we want to put our arms around them. That's how, that's where Epaphroditus was with the church. They had heard he was sick, and, and very sick, near death, and it would be good for them to be able to put their arms around him. It would be good for him to know of their love and their concern. In verse 27, when Paul describes it, he says, indeed he was ill near to death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Paul says, it, it, if he had died, it wouldn't have just been him. It would, have been, it would have been crushing to me. It would have heaped sorrow upon top of my sorrow. He says, he's sending him back, and he wants the people there to receive him warmly. Verse 28, he says, I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again and that I may be less anxious. It wasn't that, it wasn't that Paul wanted to be rid of him. Paul didn't want to be rid of him, but that Paul loved him and was his friend. Paul loved him and was his friend, but he understood that he had to send him away for his benefit and for the benefit of those other people that loved him. Now, Paul's not saying that the door to spend time with Epaphroditus or to serve with Epaphroditus is completely closed. It's not. He's going to eventually get his freedom. Possibly they serve together again. But he's saying, for right now, I'm sending him home. I'm sending him back to you. And he says, and I want you to be excited about it. I want you to have joy at his return. Don't, don't dishonor him. 
Don't think that he couldn't handle the mission field. Don't think that he's quit. It's not that. It's that I think it's best for him and for you for him to go back home. And then in verse 29 and 30, he's very specific. And he says, so receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. He says, don't dishonor him, but give him honor. Don't look down on him because he didn't stay as long as maybe you intended him to or he wanted to. Don't look down on him. Instead, honor him. Find joy in him. Don't look and see like, well, he only stayed gone for a year. Kind of a failure. I sometimes wonder, you know, he, Paul gives very specific instructions to the church on how to, how to treat Epaphroditus. I sometimes wonder what Paul said to Epaphroditus. I think I know. I, th I think I know. I think that he would have told Epaphroditus, hey, don't you beat yourself up over this. Don't beat yourself up over this. Yeah, you wanted to stay longer. You wanted to do more. It's okay. Don't, don't beat yourself up over this. Because that's how we are as people, right? We set ideas, we set goals for ourselves. Sometimes those goals are lofty. Sometimes they are completely unreasonable beyond the, the pale of reality. And yet, when we don't reach them, <sighs> stupid me. Look at me, me the failure. Well, I wanted to do X, Y, and Z, but I just couldn't make it that far. Paul tells these people, don't do that to Epaphroditus. You give him honor. You give him joy. I think that if we look at these passages, at these verses, I think there are four things, four things that we should take away from them. Four things, four characteristics of ourselves, four practices that we should embody from them. And the first is this, honor those who serve. I think it's important that we honor those who serve. Whether the, those people who serve are our friends, strangers, or whether they are we ourselves, we give honor to those who serve. Because, and here's the thing, it's not we honor those who succeed, because our understanding, our definition of success is very different than God's definition and understanding of success, right? His perspective is perfect. His, his view is clear. Ours is not. And so it may be that we go and we serve in a certain capacity and we don't get the success that we would like. This morning I heard someone say, well, my Sunday school class this morning was, there was only one person in my Sunday school class. And I understand that's discouraging. It's discouraging to prepare a lesson and have one person show up. If y'all ever want to really prank me, y'all all hide in the choir room and I'll come up and be like, all right, Wiley, it's just you and me, bud. Let's go, right? But understand, if you ever do that to me, I will probably forgive you in time. Um, but you better be prepared to stay in that choir room for 35 minutes because I'm just going to keep on preaching. Right? I'm just going to keep on preaching because I'm here to serve. I'm here to serve. We give honor to those who serve. We, give honor, we have to give a certain amount of honor to ourselves as we serve. We can't be too critical on ourselves. We can't condemn ourselves because we don't get the success that we think we ought to have. And we can't do that to other people either. We need to give them honor. We need to receive them with joy. One of the things that, that makes it a little easier to honor those who serve is that we need to build, second, we need to build deep connections with Christians. We need to build deep connections with Christians. Those five titles that he gives to Epaphroditus to be a minister and a messenger, to be a soldier, a worker, and a brother. We need to build connections in doing those things. Those are the ways that we build our deepest connections, right? Last, uh, this Wednesday night, we had a blast together. If you weren't here, I'm sorry you missed it. Hopefully we'll have a video out this week and you can watch it. But we had an amazing time here Wednesday night singing silly songs and just kind of being goofy together, 
right? And some of you got to sort of form some friendships, some new bonds and putting those productions together. And you really got to kind of see people's personalities coming out in the way they sang and performed and those sorts of things. And that's a great way to connect, but that's not gonna make a deep connection like Paul has with Epaphroditus. You wanna have a deep connection, minister together. Find some place, find someone who has needs and meet those needs together with someone and you will form a deep connection. You wanna have a deep connection? Be a soldier together. Nothing builds connection like suffering. Nothing builds connection as much as suffering. When you have suffered with someone, you know, there's a reason why, why they call, call soldiers, call each other brother in arms is because when you've suffered together, your connection isn't just fellow soldiers, it isn't just as friends, it is more like that of a brother. You've suffered together. If you wanna have a deep connection with Christians, work together. If you wanna have a deep connection, grow in affection together, and you will do that while you are serving. And let me just say this, there is, there is I think, maybe the best place to have work and suffering and grow in affection is in going on mission. Is to go on a mission trip together, to do a, some sort of mission work together is an amazing time. And here's what I've seen this week. Like, I, I see y'all that kind of like smiling. You're like, he's talking about suffering. Yeah, <laughs> I've been sleeping in a bunk bed for nine weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hit my head every morning when I wake up. No, it's great, really. No, no suffering here, no. No, everybody's cooking is amazing and this is just as comfortable as I am at home, right? You get it, right? You suffer with people and these people, many of you are, are people who are coming in and out week in, week out and you form these connections that can be very deep. What I love is I love to hear a lot of our adult six, a lot of our senior adults talk about trips that they have taken together Love to hear them talk about the trips they've taken together. And let me just tell you the thing, the stories that I have heard most often. Like you, our adult six group, they have taken some amazing trips together, but I'll tell you the story that I've heard most is the story about the time that everybody got sick. Oh yeah, this one came on the trip. I'm not gonna name any names. She doesn't go here anymore anyway. I should say her name. No, she came on the trip and she was sick and she got this one sick and then this one got sick and this one got sick. And oh, it's just like dominoes and just bleh, everywhere, right? It sounded like a horrible, horrible trip. And what's amazing to me is that as the story of this trip where all these people got sick and had what should have been a miserable time together, while that story is being told, the people who weren't there look sad that they weren't there. Oh, man, I hate that I missed that. <laughs> but the reality is, is that when we suffer together, our connection, it grows deeper. We start to really start to love each other somehow more through suffering. And so, if you really wanna grow, if you really want to build deep connections with Christians, find a way to serve with them. Find a way to suffer with them. Sometimes that suffering with them, it may be through the, through the act of service, but it sometimes may just be that when you see, when you see a fellow Christian suffering, you just come alongside them. You just come alongside them. And it may be that you can be empathetic. Maybe you've been through the same experience. Maybe when you see that someone's parent dies, you come alongside and say, I know that pain. And you just put an arm around them and you say, I know that pain. And as horrible as the experience of going through that pain has been, being able to help someone else through that journey of losing a spouse, a parent, even a child. It, it gives some deeper meaning to it. it. It redeems it, at least in some small way, to be able to say, I suffer with you. If we want to learn a lesson from Timothy and Epaphroditus, we have to honor those who serve. We build deep connections with Christians. And third, we seek the welfare of others. 
We seek the welfare of others. This is another way of saying that we look to the interests of others. We seek the welfare of others. One of the verses that I hear quoted from scripture most often is Jeremiah 29, 11. Jeremiah 29, 11. Y'all know it? Yeah. Know the plans I have for you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Right, that's, people love that verse because it's like, oh yes, the Lord is looking out for me. The Lord's looking out for me. He's gonna give me a hope, he's gonna give me, he's gonna do these things for me. God is looking out for my welfare. God is my big cuddly blanket to protect me from everything. But what we miss a lot of times, in fact, most of the time, I think people who put Jeremiah 29, 11 on their homes, on their walls, that they call that their life verse or their verse for the year, I think they miss Jeremiah 29, seven. Because before the Lord declares, I have a hope to give you a future, before the Lord declares, I'm gonna give you this welfare, before the Lord declares that, he says in 29, verse seven, he says, seek the welfare of your city. Seek the welfare of your city, because the welfare of your city is your welfare. He says, seek to prosper your town. Like, we love verse 11, because it says, God's going to take care of me. But before he got there in verse 7, he says, you take care of your city. You see needs? Meet them. You see hurting? Console them. You see people that need someone to be a friend to them, be that friend to them. Don't, don't jump to verse 11 without checking in at verse seven. Seek the welfare of your city. I love, I love what I have seen in Orange, Texas in the last two years that I've been here because I have seen believers come from across this country of ours to come and seek the welfare of our city. These people here, they're here seeking the welfare of our city. Every week, all these people are coming to seek the welfare of our city. That's not just their job, that's our job. And if we want God to keep his promise of declaring a hope and a future for us, friends, we've got to, we've got to seek the welfare of our city. It isn't enough just to look to our interests, but we must look to the interests of others. We have to seek their welfare. And then I think the fourth thing that we should learn from this is the very first thing that Paul said in, verse, in the first verse, in verse 19. He said, I hope in Jesus Christ. I hope in Jesus Christ. In the 1980s, Johnny Lee had a hit. That nobody sang it at uh, Love Through the Ages, but Johnny Lee's hit from 1980, you remember it? I've been looking for love in all the wrong places. I'll stop there. No, I won't, give me a guitar. No, he, he says, I've been looking for love in all the wrong places. And I think when Johnny Lee was talking that he meant he's been in the wrong bars. I'm not really sure, never was a big fan. But he says, I've been looking for love in the wrong, in our world, I know that people are looking for love in all the wrong places, but what's really sad to me is that we as Christians are sometimes looking for hope in all the wrong places. We look for hope in politics. Good luck. We look for hope from government. We look for hope in families. We look for hope in dating. We look for hope in our kids. We look for hope in so many places. But when Paul is looking for hope, he finds it in the only place where it is truly vested, and that is in Jesus Christ. If you and I are going to have hope, it is going to come from Jesus Christ, or it is not going to come. You may have a wealthy spouse. You may have a trust fund. You may have a lot of things that this world can provide, but none of those will give you sustained, lasting hope like Jesus Christ will. So look for hope in Jesus Christ. Don't accept any substitute because I'll tell you what happens. I'll tell you what happens. Let me give you, let me give you a picture 
Let me give you a picture of what happens if you do these four things. If you can honor those who serve, if you can honor those who serve, you will be inclined to serve. If we have in this church a culture that is honoring those who serve, and I think that we do, I am always encouraged when we have people come back from mission trips, when people come back from these different places of service, that we give them an opportunity to share, that we give an opportunity to, for us to kind of gather around them and encourage them to serve more later. As if we continue that culture that honors those who serve, we will be encouraged to serve. And if, if, if we build that culture and if we become people who are constantly going and constantly serving, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna build deep connections with each other. We're gonna build deep connections with each other Will it, where it will not be the case of you go to church with strangers, but you go to church with brothers, fellow workers, fellow soldiers. If we honor those who serve, if we serve ourselves and we build those deep connections, if we seek the welfare of this city, that. Let's be clear about this, that God has given us to this city, that he is pouring us out as a drink offering for this city to seek its welfare. He has given us to this city, and if we accept that, then he will give this city to us. You wanna win this city for Christ? Be Christ for this city. And we'll only do that if we honor those who serve, if we serve ourselves, if we seek the welfare, and then lastly, if we place our hope in Jesus Christ alone. Because if our hope is in Jesus Christ alone, it won't matter. It won't matter what sort of things the devil tosses at us. It won't matter what sort of storms we face because we recognize that Jesus is our hope and it will be unshaking. And if we can do that, then we will leave this world and our parting word will be, Yupsuko, Yupsuko, it is well with my soul. I have fought the good fight, I have run the race. It is well with my soul. That is how we will leave. We'll leave with cheerfulness. My hope and prayer for all of us is that we can do these four things, that we can be encouraged by what we see in the lives of these two men and that we can say, that is the life that I want. I want to live a life on mission for Christ. This morning, you may not have a relationship with Jesus Christ that makes you feel comfortable of going on mission. And if you've never had that relationship, if you've never begun that connection with the Lord, I pray that today you will, but I suspect that most of us have. I suspect that I'm preaching mostly to a house full of Christians, and the issue for us is not that we don't have the relationship, it's that we haven't moved. It's that we haven't understood what it is to serve, that we're not seeking the welfare of our city. My prayer for you this morning is that you will be burdened with the lostness of this city, with the needs of this city, with the pains of this city, so that we can move out of our comfort and into their suffering. Let's pray together. Most gracious Father, we thank you for today. Lord, I thank you that, that you saw us in our suffering, that that seated on the throne of heaven, that you saw our need and that you humbled yourself to become a man and then to even humble yourself further to take up a cross that we all earned. Lord, I pray that you would help us to seek the welfare of this city. Lord, we thank you for all of these people who've come and are continuing to come to meet the physical and spiritual needs of Orange, Texas. Lord, we pray that, pray that they would continue, Lord, but I pray that, that their desire to minister would be infectious for all of us, that we would be motivated, that we would be encouraged to serve. And in serving, that we would honor those who serve. We pray that we would grow closer to those that we serve alongside. That as we stand and look back at the ledger of our life, we would say, it is well with my soul. Lord, we pray if there's any who's not begun this journey with you, that today your spirit would move in their life. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with me for just a moment as we have a time of invitation, please.